You've heard about the bell curve? That's what it's all about. Remember the empirical rules of thumb, which we looked at at the end of unit C? That's what it's all about. So let's take a look at this. First, let's look at where we're at in the course. So here we go. We are in unit N, which is the start part right there, right in the middle of the course. And this is going to help us when we jump into inferential statistics in the next couple of units here, which is the, the pinnacle of the course. So this is really a pivoting point of the course here. Let's go back to where we were. All right, the normal distribution. We're going to take a look here at the importance and characteristics of the normal distribution, the standardized normal distribution, how to calculate probabilities, and then something called the normal approximation of the binomial, which I briefly mentioned in the last unit in unit B. This thing down here is a bell curve, and so you're going to see a lot of that. I'm going to be drawing a lot of bell curves, as will you, in the next several months. All right. The importance of the distribution. This is a really important distribution, and there's three main reasons for it. First of all, there's a lot of stuff which is normally distributed. And so that includes things like heights of people, weights of people, grades in a class. Uh, one of the questions that I, I have from students is, are you marking on a bell curve? And the answer is no. And part of it is that, well, I don't need to because it almost always tends to follow a normal distribution where you get more people bunched up towards the mean and fewer people on the extremities, like people who get, say, in the high 90s or, say, below um, 30 or 40 percent. The other thing is uh, you've probably heard that IQs are normally distributed, and there's been a lot of study on that one. And so the average IQ is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. So that's saying that 68.3% of Canadians should have IQs between 85 and 115, and so on. So that's going back to those empirical rules at the end of Unit C. The second thing up here is that most distributions, like the bino binomial distribution, look approximately normal as their values of their parameters increase. Let's just re go back here to the binomial distribution for a moment. And this is the guy that I'm talking about right here. So this is when you've got np greater than or equal to 5 and n times 1 minus p greater than or equal to 5, which we'll talk about at the end of this unit. But do you see that nice bell curve there? That's what uh, we're talking about there. So let's go back now and continue on. Right there. And number three, this is the most important one, actually, so I'm going to put a star beside this one. It's not going to make sense at this point, but it says that the distribution of sample means is approximately normally distributed by the central limit theorem. Yeesh, what's that all about? Well, we'll learn about that at the beginning of unit E, which is the next unit. So it's a symmetric distribution, and what I've done here is I've actually copied something from page N5. I just took a shot of it. And so you'll see this again in, in a couple of pages. But this is what it, it looks like here, is that it's a symmetric distribution. And so that means that the mean is equal to the median. That didn't come out very well there. So the mean is equal to the median. And in this particular case, then, is 60. By the way, the example that we're going to be focusing in here is the marks for the 50 students, which we saw back in Unit G and C. The second thing here, then, is that it's bell-shaped, and the following proportions, which are summarized in the empirical rules, are introduced at the end of Unit C. So... Remember back then what we said was that 68.3% of the distribution is between one standard deviation either side of the mean. So if we have a mean here of, of 60 and a standard deviation of 12, so a, oops, a mu equal to 60 and a sigma equal to 12, then 
60 minus 12 is 48, 60 plus 12 is 72, so 68.3% is in that particular range there. Now we could further divide that, because this is symmetric, into, and I'll take this to four decimal places, you'll see why, because of the tables that we're going to be using, are 0.3413, so that's half of that 68.3%. And then within two standard deviations, we've got 95.4%. And so that's a further 0.1359 or about 14% on either side of that 34%. So all of those four in the middle there added up makes 95.4. And then if we go three standard deviation, there's an extra 2%. And so add those together and you'll get 90. 9.7%, and that leaves us with a little bit on the outside, 0 0.0014. So less than three standard deviations or greater than three standard deviations. So that's what we mean by the empirical rules, and actually we'll see how that fits in with our particular um, marks of 50 students. The third thing is that it's a continuous distribution. And so what we mean by that, then, is that it's best used for describing things like heights, which are measured, and weights, and even IQs and things like that. It, it's true that when you're talking about these things, we tend to round them, of course. So when we're talking about somebody's height, we will round that to the nearest quarter inch or to the nearest centimeter. Although you could theoretically, of course, you could take that down to a fraction of a centimeter. The um, problem with that, of course, is that unless, you're, unless you don't have any hair on you, um, hair itself is, is, uh, takes up a certain amount of, of space and, and so on. And it depends what you've got on your feet and all that kind of stuff there. So we typically don't go down to less than a centimeter or maybe a quarter of an inch. But that is something that we could theoretically do. Just like a person's age, of course. We tend to round that to the nearest year. Uh, but you could go to the nearest month or day. And uh, even to the nearest hour or the nearest second. Or milliseconds and, and so on like that. Milliseconds, of course, is not, a pr is not practical because of the way that we record births at the hospital. To the nearest minute. But it is theoretically, then, a continuous distribution. So a probability for a continuous distribution is shown as the area under the curve between two points. And 100% or 1.00 of the area is under the curve. So that's going to be an important thing as we go forward here. So let's take a look, then, at the fourth thing, a probability is found using this formula. Now, how many of you are in calculus right now? Can you integrate that? It turns out, actually, that not only is that a really difficult thing to integrate, it, it actually is impossible. There's some functions which you can't find an integral for. And so um, you have to use something like a McLaren's approximation or something, which if you were to take further stats courses, or further math calculus courses, pardon me, you would learn about such things. But you'll never have to do that. I just put that down here to show you that there is a formula for it. What we do is we're going to be, we're going to be using tables, and that'll be discussed in a bit here. You'll see that in a few pages here. And finally then, the distribution is described by its parameters mu and sigma. You remember what they were for a binomial distribution? They were n and p. And if you take a look at the formula for a binomial distribution, all it had was n's and p's, and then, of course, for a given x, you would be able to find the probability. If you take a look at the formula above here, without really diving into it and so on, what you'll see is there's x's and there's... Oops, sorry. There's x's, there's mu's, and there's sigmas. So again, mu and sigma are the two parameters. And if you know what the uh, x is that you're looking for, then you can simply stick that in. Everything else, then, is a constant here. e is a constant, pi is a constant, 2, of course. 
And so if you knew those two, mu and sigma, then for any x, or two x's, if you're looking at an area between two, then you can figure out what the probability is. Let's take a look at a couple of simple ones here. First of all, this is more a theoretical one, and but an important thing to keep in mind here is what is the probability that x is less than k? Why is that exactly the same as less than x is less than or equal to k? And so suppose I'm looking at some value, let's call it k here, and what I'm saying here is that when we're calculating a probability, we're just going to take a look at the probability or the area from k down. So this is going to be some probability here. And that's shown as an area under the curve. Now, the important thing to note here is that because this is a continuous distribution, then there's really no difference between less than k and less than or equal to k. The difference is the area of a single line, which in the limit is zero. For those of you who are taking calculus, you know what I'm talking about there. All right? That's a big difference than when we were talking about the binomial distribution. Remember in the binomial distribution, you have integer values. And so when we're talking about tossing coins or rolling dice or something like that, and we're looking for the number of successes, you can have three successes, four successes, five uh, successes, you can't have three and a half successes. And so when we say, what's the probability that you have less than four successes in a binomial experiment, it means we really jump down and start at three, three all the way down. That's not the case with a continuous distribution. In a continuous distribution, the numbers are continuous. And so I uh, think of it in terms of income. What's the probability that a person has an income of less than $50,000? Well, that's virtually the same as less than or equal to $50,000. Because really the difference is $49,999.99. And you, you could, by calculation, take that even further to, to more decimal places beyond the penny. So we don't get hung up then on whether it's less than or less than or equal to. We just simply note the direction of the sign, that it's less than k or that it's greater than k. All right, what is the probability that x is less than mu? Well, remember that this is a symmetric distribution and mu is in the middle. And if it's symmetric, then it's also equal to the median. And so this whole area here is going to be 50%. All right, so that's the important thing to note is you got 50% of the distribution on each half. And when we take a look at the tables, that will be important. Let's take a look at the real problem here that we were, uh, that I've already introduced to you. And we've seen back in unit G, back in unit C, there are 50 persons in a stats class. The midterm marks are normally distributed with a mean equal to 60 and a standard deviation equal to 12. Sketch the distribution of the marks. Well, I, I actually have that over here on page N5. These are the actual numbers here. Um, we wrote those before in, instead of just a single column. We had them as no, four or five rows, but there's 50 numbers here. And uh, so they go from 34 up to 90. And if you went back in units G and C, you would see that those are the numbers. And I actually designed this to be perfectly normal. And so if you average out those numbers, calculate the arithmetic mean, you'll get a mean of 60, which is right in here. And the standard deviation turns out to be equal to 12. So if we go 60 minus 12, we'll get 48 right here. And if we go 60 plus 12, we'll get 72. And if we count these up, you're going to find that there's 17 out of 50 observations here and 17 out of 50 observations here. So 34% in each of those areas, since it's symmetric, 
and together makes <clears throat> 34 out of 50, which is 68%. So in a perfect distribution, with a perfect normal distribution, you've got 68.3%. So that's as close as you can get here. If we go another 12 below 48, it takes it to 36, and um, 72 plus 12 takes it to 84. And you'll find that there's, if you count them up, there'll be 7 out of 50 observations here. You can just count them up here. And there's 7 here, which is about 14%. If you add all of those together, you're going to get 48 out of 50 observations, which is 96%, which is about as close as you can get to 95.4% with 50. And then finally, if you go another 12, so that would take us down here to uh, 24, and it would take us up here to over 100. Um, it would take us... Oh, 96, yeah, of course. Then you can see here that we've got 100% of the observations. And so that fits with our third empirical rule that says that 99 0.7% of the observation should be within three standard deviations, and we've got all 100. So that's what the thing looks like, and I've, I've actually just copied that here and put in the actual percentages from before, as well as the numbers. You can see the numbers there in green, the ones that we just counted. So that's what we've got here then for the distribution of marks. So now we can come down here and take a look at this where it says, well, what proportion of the class has marks between 48 and 72? So the way that we would write that is like this. 48, x is between 48 and 72. Remember, we don't get hung up on whether this is less than or equal to 72, right? Greater than or equal to 48. It doesn't matter. I generally just leave those off and just put them down like this because it's a continuous distribution. The important thing is which way the sign is going. Now, 48 is one standard deviation below the mean, right? 60 minus 12. And 72 is one standard deviation above the mean. So that's our first empirical rule. And our first empirical rule says that we should have 68.3% of the observations. It turns out that we're at 68% when you actually add them all up. And so I'm looking at these green numbers here. And if you count those up there, you'll see 17 plus 17 is 34 divided by 50 is equal to um, 68%. So that's our first empirical rule that we have here. Right. Second thing here is what proportion of the class has marks less than 48? So this would be, what's the probability that lex, uh, x is less than 48? Now this is mu minus one standard deviation. So let me just change colors here. What we're looking at then is from 48 down. And if we were to add up those numbers, that would come to about 16% right there. So that's 7 plus 1 is 8 over 50, and that's 16%. So that is, uh, it's easy to calculate these probabilities when they fall on those dividing lines of 1, 2, 3 standard deviations on either side of the mean. But what do you do with this guy down here? What proportion of the class has marks less than 80? Like this. Oops. How do you calculate that? The problem that we have here is that if you take a look up here, where does 80 fall? Let me change this to maybe something, um, how about purple? 80 is right here. So it, I'm just going to do a real quick sketch here and say, here's a normal distribution. And we've got 60 here. We're looking for 80 down. So this area right in here. 
The problem that we've got here is that it doesn't fall on those probabilities that we looked before. Here's 72, and here's 84, and it's somewhere between those two. It's between one and two standard deviations. Um, you can't just simply interpolate and say, well, let's see, 80 is, uh, let's see, we've got, um, that'd be 8 twelfths of the way between the first and second standard deviation. You can't, you can't do it that way because this particular function here, the normal function, is not linear, right? It's curved. So take a look at, at this area up here between 72 and 84, and you can see that curve there. And so you can't just simply do a linear interpolation. There's got to be a better way of doing that. And that's where we're going to take a look at something called the standardized normal distribution. So we're going to look at that then in the next lesson.